You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. I want to be the title sponsor. What's it going to cost? I think around 10 million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. With exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Where are we, Lionel? We're in Manchester. What are we doing here? Well, I'm having a toasted bacon and egg sandwich and a cup of tea. And you're having a very restrained coffee. Anything uh, else? Oh, yeah. We've, um, we've just interviewed Sir Bradley Wiggins for next week's podcast. We're getting really organised, aren't we? It's, it's unprecedented levels of planning, organisation. We're going to carry this through into 2016, which will be our best year yet. <laughs> <laughs> Easy, Lionel. Easy. I think Lionel's had too many coffees today. Right, so we've met Bradley Wiggins. We had a really interesting half-hour conversation with him. That will be next week's podcast. This week, we've got something a little bit different. We're releasing this podcast on the day that the story about the long-awaited story about Chris Froome's physiological testing comes out. We're going to talk about that. We're going to hear a little bit from Chris Froome in the lab and from Jeroen Swart, the sports scientist who was there as well. That's coming up a bit later on. Indeed, and we've also got uh, a little bit of an interview with Alex Dowsett, who I met up with at the weekend. Just to sort of throw forward to next week's interview with Bradley Wiggins, one of the things he talked about was you know, how he got into cycling as a child and the sort of the heroes he held up, the posters he put up on his bedroom wall. And I had a slight moment of that because Alex Dowsett just happened to be in the village where I lived at the weekend going out doing a ride to promote his training company and I just transported myself back to when I was 12 or 13 thinking how amazing it would have been if a professional cyclist who'd ridden the Giro ridden the Tour de France had come to my village and and there was a few kids there going out on the ride and I thought this is how cycling embeds itself in the psyche of the nation. We don't want to sound too much like fanboys here Lionel but I do remember during the Tour de France as well we had dinner one evening in the Pyrenees with Greg Lamond and Cathy Lamond Mm. and when they got up and left to drive to their hotel you said if if the 15 year old me could have seen me having dinner with Greg Lamond there there are you do have moments like that don't you yeah the 15 year old me would have chastised me on my you know my table manners and all sorts you know my choice of food probably that evening well I I, I, uh, probably yeah something (laughs) I do do remember Tartiflet was that when I was was working on my Robert Miller book and I I was emailing a lot of former writers Alan Piper Pedro Delgado Greg Lamond I was getting all these emails from these people and I said to my brother God, if the 15-year-old me could have seen me getting emails from these guys, he'd have said, what the hell's email? <laughs> Absolutely. Just on the point about fanboys, yeah, completely take your point. I'm not necessarily getting fanboyish about Alex Dowsett there, um, but I think, you know, we do sometimes lose sight of the fact that people are interested in cycling because it's their hobby, their interest, it's something they're passionate about. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be journalistic objectivity, and I suppose this sort of leads quite nicely into our main talking point of today's podcast. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. So we heard from Bradley Wiggins, as interesting as ever, wasn't he, Lionel? And I'm sure there are things that we can talk about. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I just want to go back to the start of the podcast. I hope I haven't alienated all of the listeners who live north of Watford Gap with my comment about it being a bit grey. Not for the first time. No, probably not. Probably not. But I'm just a bit grouchy. I had to get up at five o'clock this morning. I had to stand on the train all the way to Stoke before I could get a seat. Just crotchety. Well, we're used to that, Lionel. You know. <laughs> so, listen, we were going to talk a bit about the story that's been published today, if you're listening on Friday, the day that this podcast is released, concerning Chris Froome. Perhaps you should take the lead on this, Sir Lionel. Well, yeah, we perhaps should plug our forthcoming Friends special, our first Friends special episode of 2016, which will be put online in early January. Early to mid-January. Yeah, will be your trip to the laboratory, the GlaxoSmithKline laboratory, where Chris Froome undertook these tests. I mean, that's a much fuller examination of, of the story, but let's just go back to the beginning and sort of why this whole thing has come up, because... 
Chris Froome basically pledged during the tour, while all the speculation and, and doubts about his performance were swirling around the, the press room and, and cyberspace and elsewhere, he pledged to basically produce his numbers, show the world what he's capable of as an athlete. So there were some people who were sceptical that he would actually get round to doing this, but not that long after the tour and just before the Vuelta, you found yourself in the lab, Richard, with him. I, I didn't just find myself there. I, I actually went there out of my own volition. Well, exactly. But how did that come up? How come you were the journalist who was there? Well, I got a phone call about 10 days after the tour finished from Michelle Froome, who is Chris Froome's wife and manager. She had made contact with the lab, GSK Lab, during the tour and set the wheels in motion for Froome to go and be tested. They'd also engaged a, a sports scientist in South Africa from the University of Cape Town, Jeroen Swart, a very respected sort of sports scientist and physiologist. And Michelle phoned me up out of the blue. I was actually riding my bike in Richmond Park at the time with Rob Hatch and um, said they were looking for a journalist to come and witness the testing and report on it. And I knew that they'd been speaking to David Epstein, the author of The Sports Gene, and actually quite a qualified scientist himself. And I felt somebody like that would be a a better choice, frankly. And I initially was quite hesitant. Uh, Jeroen Swart, who I don't know but have interviewed before, he then called me and convinced me that the job of the journalist was not to interpret things but to merely report what was what was found out and and you know it was a scientist's job too not to interpret so much but to gather the, the data analyze it and and so I was more comfortable with that and I agreed to to do it to be the journalist there and so I went along I took my recorder did a lot of recording of interviews with with Froome and with the scientists involved and that will all feature in a, an extended friend special in in January but, you know, the story's out there now, the, the numbers are out there. I'm not a scientist, so, you know, I think as cycling journalists, we do, it's become sort of incumbent upon us to, to gain a basic understanding of science, sports science and physiology and so on. But, you know, I, what the reaction will be, I don't know. I know there's been some reaction already, even to the choice of publication, Esquire magazine. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, how did that come about? Why Esquire? Why not a, a cycling magazine or a, or a newspaper? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, it was entirely up to me. I, I should say that the Frooms, Chris and Michelle, were not obviously given copy approval. They, they didn't approve the story. They, they did read it before publication because there was medical information in it and the legal people required that they read it but they weren't given any opportunity to influence what was written in the story I had an entirely free hand on that as it obviously as it should be it was also entirely up to me where the story should be published and it was a difficult one where else you know Esquire might seem like an odd choice but then you start to ask yourself well where else I mean it's a 4,000 word story there are very few publications that would publish a 4,000 word story Esquire does have a, a fine tradition of long-form journalism and I did a, a piece with them last year on Jamaican athletics, which I thought they did a really good job with, showed a lot of interest in. And so that's why I went back to them with this, and they were very keen. And it's got a big audience as well, I guess, a big mainstream audience, which I suppose is uh, when you're trying to get the story out there to as many people as possible, rather than just a, a cycling audience. Was that something that, that influenced you? Or, or in terms of newspapers, I mean, you could have approached one of the sort of broadsheet newspapers see if they would be interested in it for their magazines yeah i'm sure that they would i mean i think i i felt that it was a, a big story of general interest and, and therefore i wanted to put it in a in a general publication i think it's an interesting story i think the background to it is fascinating i think the fact of a, a an elite athlete volunteering to go to a lab and be tested in this way whatever you think of the results or the merits of him doing it i think that's a very interesting story and it's perhaps you know, something that we'll see develop with other athletes who are keen to... It's not about proving your, your innocence or proving that you're clean. It's just about giving the world a bit more information about how your body works. And I think Froome himself was interested to find out a bit more about how his body works. So I didn't want to give it to a cycling magazine for that, for that reason. And, and the problem with newspapers is, and, you know, we are the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, but you give it to one newspaper and, and you annoy the others. You can't keep everybody happy. So giving it to a general interest magazine seemed to me the best sort of compromise. I mean, the choice of publication is a little bit of a red herring, really, because it doesn't actually matter in the grand scheme of things where it appears, as long as everybody has access to read it if they wish but in terms of your decision to do it did you have any misgivings any you said you were hesitant but 
being a journalist, the perception might be that you've been selected, handpicked. You might put a, a friendlier slant on it, particularly, you know, don't want to draw too much attention to it, but the fact that you wrote The Sky's the Limit book, there is a perception from some people out there that that's in some way a kind of PR handbook for Team Sky. I mean, I've read the book, I know it isn't, but... Well, no, it isn't. It I mean, come your way. It, it, I'm well aware of that, and that was one reason for my hesitation along with my lack of expertise in, in sports science and physiology. So, yeah, th- these were definitely concerns. But then on the other hand... You know, if you're a journalist, offered this opportunity to go to a laboratory and witness a double Tour de France winner being tested, it would be crazy to turn that down, really. But yeah, that that perception is one I think that we're all very conscious of. You don't have to have written a book called Sky's the Limit. You only have to be a British journalist covering the sport for British publications to be labelled as as some kind of Sky fanboy. We've all had it. My book Sky's the Limit was not an official book. I didn't go down the embedded route or you know even ask for cooperation didn't even tell them I was doing it it came as quite a surprise to some of them when it came out so it's an odd one that but that's something that I've had since 2011 when the book was was published and of course it was a very different story back then my that book was about their first year the story and the team developed since then but you know going back to the lab I think this is a a starting point rather than an end point I think that it's a start of a a, a deeper conversation discussion about what it takes to win the Tour de France and I think that what for me was most interesting about it was not maybe so much the the figures that Froome produced in the lab on this occasion which were as you'd expect a Tour de France winner to produce the really interesting bit was the surfacing of his lab report from 2007 he did go into lab in 2007 when he was part of the World Cycling Centre that report had seemed to have vanished Michel Froome tracked it down after his visit to the GSK lab and what was fascinating about it was how similar physiologically Froome is, the only difference is that he was considerably fatter considerably considerably heavier back then Well I've read the Esquire piece and I think one thing that leapt out to me really is that it won't be judged necessarily on the basis upon which it was produced I mean it seemed, it's pretty clear to me having read it that you are a witness to events you're not there to interpret or come down on one side or the other side, you're there just to tell people what went on in these tests and that the Esquire article is not the full scientific analysis of these results, that's being done separately and, and will be released I gather separately do you think this is going to solve any of the problems that Chris Froome has faced in the wake of winning the Tour de France or during the process of winning the Tour de France, which is there's this scepticism from quite a lot of people that he is doing it naturally? It's not going to change anything, is my view, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, the, the reaction to the Esquire piece began about two weeks before the piece was published and before anyone had read it. And, and uh, you know, you see the reaction coming already people's minds are made up. I don't think it's going to change anybody's mind. I think that people who don't believe that Froome is, is the real deal will find things in the story to pick apart and to use for, you know, in the case against him. I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't legitimate concerns or questions, but, and those who believe that he is the real deal will probably feel reassured to know or to have a bit more confidence in the fact that This is not somebody who underwent some dramatic transformation prior to the 2011 Vuelta, you know, when he went from being a journeyman pro to a Grand Tour contender at at the Vuelta. I think that that it lays to rest this idea that that there was this dramatic transformation. I don't think physiologically there was. And I think that highlights how complicated a sport cycling can be and that it's more than just a test of somebody's physiology, somebody's engine, which is an interesting subject for further discussion but no I don't think it's going to really resolve anything I think Froome is to be commended for for doing it and putting information out there in the in the public domain that I don't think anybody else has really done and it will appear in a scientific paper that should be published in the next few months according to the the scientists and that will contain obviously an awful lot more detail the nitty-gritty of how his body works. I think that's the key thing, isn't it? The, the reason this is important at the moment is because Chris Froome said he would do these tests and he has now done these tests. The fact is that people will look at those results and say, well, now we need to know this. Now we need to know biopassport data. Now we need to know much more information on blood values and, and um, 
it's a bit like Pandora's box, isn't it? It just it just opens the way to the next level of questioning. Yeah, um, I mean, there are there's information on blood values in there as well, and and a comparison with 2007, the blood passport didn't exist then, so there there was no off score, but there are certain values that can be compared. And it was interesting for me because we were brought up in an era when hematocrit seemed to be all important. I was told, speaking to to doctors, that hematocrit is now something that we should ignore more or less and and not focus on so his hematocrit was you know 43 to 45 from the three tests i have from 2007 one in the middle of the tour de france this year and one in august i'm told to ignore that so we've got his off scores and things like that in there yeah well hematocrit i mean that was um very quietly shelved as an indicator of doping I mean, the history of hematocrit is uh, it was at one point it was the only way to indicate whether somebody had been blood doping, the only tool that the authorities had. And so this 50 percent limit became the the black line between right and wrong. And um, it was, I think, in early 2008 that the UCI just sort of stopped acting upon. I mean, they'd still use it as an indicator of whether to target more testing, but the but the failure of the hematocrit test, you know, that just quietly stopped. There was no great announcement about it. But people will latch on to that, I'm sure, as they will latch on to other things there in are, the report. The, there are things, obviously, that are not in the report. Even a, a piece of 4,000 words omits things. There'll be a lot more detail in our podcast, which will be out in mid-January. It'll be £10, incidentally, to become a friend of the podcast next year. We'll, we'll be announcing full details of our friend scheme soon. But, you know, things like therapeutic use exemptions. I think Froome's already on the record talking about this. I asked him all about this. He's had two therapeutic use exemptions in his entire career, he told me. And I asked him things like, you know, imagine if he was a pro in 1997 uh, and you really were faced with a choice of take EPO or go home. What would he have done? I asked him questions like that, which I thought were interesting and he he did engage with those sorts of questions I thought really well what came across to me in the lab speaking to him was his bafflement really it might seem strange to us but his bafflement at the suspicion that surrounds him and his genuine confusion as to why that exists and how he goes about proving that he's clean And, and this was a step positive step I think for him to take but there will be more and the the conversation will change it will move on the discussion will move on next year we'll be asking different questions but we should um we should probably leave it there lionel there's there's a lot there's a lot to read in the piece i hope and there'll be a lot to come in our friend's special podcast this is the telegraph cycling podcast download old episodes absolutely free at the cyclingpodcast.com okay so we've discussed Chris Froome and the test. Let's hear a little bit. As I said, it, we're be doing a, a friend special coming out in January on this, and you'll hear a lot from Froome and the scientists in the lab. But let's just hear a little bit of Chris Froome the day that he visited the GSK lab, and also Jeroen Swart, the sports scientist who had travelled over on the red eye from Cape Town. Chris, yeah. we're in the we're in the lab here. What what brought you here? What what is it you want? to get out of this? I think uh, a number of factors, but predominantly to, to find out more about my own physiology. It's something that I've wanted to do for, for quite a while now. Even at the beginning of the season, I was looking into it, and then obviously during the Tour de France, it became a more immediate need to do some physiological testing. So I'm, I'm quite happy to do it and um, to understand a bit more about my body and what I can actually improve on in the future. I mean, a lot of people are surprised, obviously, as we know that these kind of tests aren't done routinely on elite athletes, but I guess they're not. I think the, the thing with us is if you've got time, you're going to rather spend that time out on the road training and, and really focus on the, on the performance side of things, whereas testing does take away from that a little bit. It takes a lot of planning. It's, it's time-consuming. It's, it's time away from day-to-day training. So in, in a way, you probably are sacrificing a little bit in, in terms of the performance side. But in the long run, I'd like to think that something like this would be ven- very beneficial. Mm. I mean, there's been so much about the, the VO2 in particular and about you submitting to these tests in general. Yeah. You did the VO2 max test earlier. Were, were you nervous before it? I, I didn't really know what, what was going to come out of it, to be honest. And I, I still don't know the results just yet. But um, I'm sure I'll, I'll get a, a summary of it all later on. But yeah, a little bit nervous. I mean, at the end of the day, whatever the number is, I wasn't going to be able to change that. It's not as if I could pedal faster and get a different number. So 
Um, I gave it everything I had and um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully that's uh, going to satisfy all, all the questions that have been asked about it. One of the, we were talking about this earlier, but one of the problems, I guess, is, is the lack of information there is out there about athletes at Chris's level. And so this is the, there's a sort of information vacuum and people are comparing Chris's performances with the obvious ones, Lance Armstrong, etc. But really we don't know an awful lot about what athletes at this level are physiologically capable of because the anecdotes you hear, Nairo Quintana's got a VO2 of 90 or whatever, none of this seems to be actually verified and, and it's rumour and speculation as much as anything. Is that a real problem and is that why doing this work on Chris is so valuable? It is. It's, it's, it's valuable for a number of reasons. The, the, as you point out, I mean, the, there is such a paucity of data with regards to elite cyclists and particularly cyclists at Chris's level having won the Tour de France published in, 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 in real scientific journals. I did scour the literature and I couldn't even find a single VO2 max value for anyone at Chris's level. So, And that's going to be definitely shedding a lot of light on what it takes to, to, to be able to ride at, at this level and to be able to win the Tour de France. Mm-hmm. Um, the other aspect of that is that you know we, we've had a lot of speculation and people throwing around all kinds of numbers and then making inferences based on those numbers. The reality is we don't have the numbers to compare. So, you know, making judgment calls based on, on a lack of information just leads to pure speculation. So in that way, it's a good way to actually just lay down some, some actual objective figures in terms of uh, what athletes at this level are capable of so, uh, mm. so that we can, uh, you know, make uh, objective comments rather than just speculate. You're listening to The Telegraph Cycling Podcast. So Lionel, you mentioned that you bumped into Alex Dowsett in your local cafe. I did, yeah. The Hub Cafe in Redbourne. It's owned by Simon Barnes, uh, who aficionados of British cycle racing will know own the Ploughman Craven team, which was one of the big domestic teams a few years back. Um, and Simon runs a cafe and a bike shop in the village where I live, and Alex Dowsett, uh, he's setting up a, a training company. He's still in his off-season, really, and they held a ride-out from the cafe, and I popped along. Unfortunately, couldn't take part in the ride because I had other things on later on that morning. But just, again, foreshadowing next week's chat with Bradley Wiggins about his hour record, I also talked to Alex about when he broke and briefly held the hour record earlier this year. Good morning, Alex. We're in the Hub Cafe in Redbourne in Hertfordshire. Cold, crisp Saturday morning, a very late November. A lot of cyclists already in here. Everyone's having a pre-ride coffee. But can you just explain a little bit what everybody is here for this morning? Uh, we're doing a bit of a ride out just uh, with myself. And it's, it's part of my, my new venture called Cyclism. It's myself, James Millard and Holly Noble working on... Uh, at the moment, it's a, it's a coaching company. Sort of back end of last year... I'd ride with people and I'd listen to them talk and realise just in some cases how either how much they didn't know or how much they couldn't get access to the right kind of support to further their career. And, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the, the guys that are trying to race and working in jobs, it's they're every bit as committed as I am to racing. Um, we just have to make make the most of their time and obviously I've, I'm lucky with um, with the support I get so I thought I wanted to offer all of them guys a the sort of same level of support as us world tour riders get um, and so what the our basically our ethos is is to everyone that works within cyclism so our coaches our physios our, our osteos we'd, everyone I'd, I'd be happy for them to sort of look after my career so and then obviously I'm racing at the highest level, so that's um, so I think everyone that signs up should be confident that they'll get the sort of the highest level of service. At the moment, I'm not doing much intensity at all. It's long, steady miles. But if you've only got eight hours a week to train, long, steady miles aren't gonna aren't gonna help you. So you do need to drop some intensity, and so that's where sort of that's where the the guidance comes in. Um, and then. You know, we'll have a look at the riders if they need a bike fit, if they need, um, you know, if they're a time trial specific rider. Like, I'll have a look at their position. Just I'm not qualified, but I've, I've got a bit of experience now in the time trial world. So um, yeah, we're just just basically uh, just trying to help, just trying to help everyone be sort of the best that they can be. We've already had riders of a 
of a almost professional standard come to us and then what we want is newbies that come in and say I'm I'm only training for the, the London doing the London to Brighton or the London 100 next year and giving that um, giving all of them sort of the same level of support talking about your own winter what have you been up to since your racing season ended and and, and sort of how far through your own prep for 2016 are you I had my off season so I had a month where I didn't do a great deal of bike riding at all it's mountain biking go-karting just sort of spending time with my mates and being normal then started at the moment I'm doing yeah starting to ramp up the miles um, a lot of work in the gym actually now more than I've I've done before um, trying to get a lot of it in now so that when when the, the real hard stuff on the bike comes in I can I can take a step back from it so so do you know what 2016 kind of has in store do you know a race program where you're starting off I've got a rough idea um, and it is always it, this time of the year it is only a rough idea but the, the plan at the moment is looking to be like I'll go to um, the first main target with the Giro um, and there's two time trials in there that really do suit me so that would be that would be good um, and I think I'll be kicking off the season with Challenge Me or come perhaps Dubai this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. Finally for this week, we're just going to give you a little update on our Trainer Road progress. Uh, although a reminder that our latest number 10 Friends special has just been released. That's Lionel in conversation with Adam and Simon Yates. Very entertaining, that was too. And that's available for Friends of the Podcast. You can still sign up £5 for the year number 11 will be coming soon and we're also going to release a bonus 12th friend special over the Christmas period uh, and then 2016 we're going to kick off with Chris Froome a really long detailed look at his recent lab test uh, you've heard a little clip from that already we'll have full details very soon about becoming a friend for 2016 the, the price is going to go up to £10 and um, hopefully though the improved technology the mobile accessibility which we're in the final stages that'll be coming on December the 15th as a plan and hopefully the technology has been enhanced and you will feel that that is worth your hard earned money so let's just update people a bit on Trainer Road Trainer Road very kindly sponsoring the podcast through the winter months but with the condition that we follow their training programs which we have been doing fairly religiously you speak for yourself i have been following it religiously i haven't missed a session yet i think 15 or 16 of these hour or hour and a half long training sessions on the turbo i've done people have uh, tweeted us and asked you know exactly how does it work and uh, basically it's an app and so you're training along you there's a sensor on the on the back wheel a sensor on the um, crank and all of that data feeds to your iphone or other device and tells the uh, tells the app how much power you're putting out, what your cadence is, and you, you, you basically follow a power chart for an hour or an hour and a half. Peddling I'm worried on. I'm becoming a bit like Chris Froome. I, I, I do spend the entire time just staring at my screen in a Chris Froome-esque way. Well, yeah, you have to keep up to the watts or, in some cases, sort of keep the watts down as you, you recover. It's effectively... Uh, it's like intervals that we've all probably done on the turbos before but the thing about this is that it it feels interactive doesn't it you look at that screen and it's telling you exactly what to do and you don't feel like you're selling yourself short or cutting corners because you're trying to keep up to the up to the watch it's it's like having a coach sort of stood next to you telling you what to do funny thing is um, i'm probably putting out about half half as many watts as chris from i did one the other day lionel palisade that absolutely killed me an hour and a half that was the hardest one yet and i was in bits afterwards I, I cramped up quite badly that night and uh, while watching TV and I was like a cat on a hot tin roof bouncing around the room squealing you want to keep an eye on your hydration are you drinking enough when you're doing I'm certainly drinking enough oh sorry <laughs> well try and stick to water if you can during the turbo sessions or uh, and, and, and then uh, it does give you a little instruction on the screen doesn't it to take care of your post ride nutrition I, I always enjoy that I keep meaning to take a screen grab of that and, and sending it to you because I imagine that's the highlight of your ride start thinking about your post-ride nutrition that's what <laughs> yeah. I've been doing for the last hour exactly five minutes in I'm already thinking 55 minutes ahead to what I'm gonna, what I'm going to be eating um, I mean, I'm feeling the benefits I do you know lost a bit of weight feel stronger fitter more productive that sounds like the intro to a radiohead song 
let's hear a little bit from coach Chad Timmerman, who um, is the, the, the genius behind Trainer Road. We caught up with him recently just to get a little um, a little bit of feedback from him on our progress so far. He's been like big in a Big Brother style, keeping an eye on our on our workouts, making sure that our power, power curves are are legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, looking for any suspicious fluctuations and so on, I think. Uh, but um, let's hear from from Coach Chad, who we caught up with recently. Here he is. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Rob Hatch and I recently caught up with Coach Chad Timmerman from Trainer Road to ask him for his thoughts and comments on our progress so far. So far, so good. It looks like, I mean, all you guys, you paced your efforts uh, well. You know, uh, I, I know none of you are on electronic trainers, so keeping it uh, smooth is quite a challenge. You guys all did a good job. There were like little lifts toward the end. Things indicated that maybe you held back a little bit if you could push that hard toward the end of an effort that's supposed to be pretty depleting. But that's all part of the nature of learning how to assess and how to pace for these specific durations. In this case, the eight-minute jobbers. So they looked good. Uh, it, as it turned out, really coincidentally, all of you guys are very much in line with each other in terms of functional threshold power. Um, the one a mild exception is it looks like Lionel's a little lighter than you guys. So his, his strength to weight is a little up. So something to kind of maybe motivate Rob and Richard um, to either shed some weight or elevate their power at a, at a mildly quicker rate than Lionel. I can't exaggerate how disturbing it was to hear that Lionel's power to weight was better than mine and Rob's. And we'll see what we can do about that over the coming weeks. But some of the work that we've been doing with Train Road has involved or included one-legged pedaling, which was novel for me and, and for Rob and, and Lionel as well. I asked Chad whether that was to help balance the body to get both work, legs working equally uh, and to balance things out or to encourage smoother pedaling. Uh, it's actually a combination of both. So primarily with sweet spot base, we're looking to increase uh, your your strength endurance, you know, how hard you can push the pedals and then be able to maintain that effort level, which basically is all about elevating your FTP or at least creating a base upon which we'll later elevate your FTP. But in the process, um, especially being indoors and having very little to focus on other than the work itself, we can introduce some, some uh, ideally productive drills. And, and like you said, they can, they can suss out issues and they can also just help you improve your form in a more general sense. So, I mean, largely we're looking to, to maybe balance out the, the power input that's coming from each of your legs, but also to smooth out your pedal stroke, um, help you determine, you know, just how well you're pedaling. Uh, if you've got dead spots, if uh, one knee moves laterally more than the other, but just, just an opportunity to kind of open your eyes to the fact that maybe you can turn the pedals a little more efficiently. We've all been interested, I think, in following the workouts on the emphasis on form, which is a big thing in running where with this focus on mechanics and running form style, if you like. And this is something that's incorporated in the trainer road workouts as well. And we asked Chad about this. Not too many people directly address form. You know, they might work in a little bit here and there, do some speed drills, but it's usually simple. It's not very structured and it doesn't get the, the due attention that, that I feel it deserves. Finally, at this early stage in our trainer road program, Chad gives us a progress report. Your workouts are looking good and I'm already seeing indications where you're kind of outperforming the workout requirements. And on top of that, you're coming back for the next, you know, the, for the next two, three subsequent workouts and, and keeping those on track too. So it's not like you're blowing yourself up by trying to outdo one another or maybe uh, one of the workouts and, and losing sight of what we're after. And the, and the progress so far has been uh, measurable and noticeable. So good news on all fronts. The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. Pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist. Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. That was Coach Chad. So it's been a packed episode this week. A bit like your mouth, Lionel, currently. A packed mouth full of bacon and egg. Toasty. So I don't know if I've got to ramble on for a bit here until you're able to talk again. But we're just going to say cheerio. Daniel, we met with Daniel the other day. We did an episode with Daniel coming out in a couple of weeks. He is back and he is, but he unfortunately couldn't make it up to Manchester today. So he'll not 
he's not in this week's podcast or next week's but he will be back the following week the humidity would have played havoc with his hair though and we've spared him that at least haven't we yeah no absolutely and the, he has had his hair cut recently it's still quite a quite a length Bradley Wiggins style, he's become quite hairy as well over the winter mm, Daniel's sort of macy grey as it always springs to mind when I see him walking towards me <laughs> right let's wrap up there um, thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard pleasure listening to the telegraph cycling podcast thank you to glass pair for the music in this episode for more information and to download more editions of the show visit the cyclingpodcast.com the telegraph cycling podcast brought to you by trainer road cycling's most effective training tool pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk-free for 30 days.